How's everybody doing today? Uh, I got the nice post-lunch session, so everyone's all full. I can see everyone's got the itis. We're going to try to keep you awake through this thing. Um, my talk is titled DevOps, the Good, Bad, and the Ugly. We're mostly going to focus on the bad and the ugly, <laughs> right? <laughs> not, that, not that I don't love DevOps, right? I love DevOps, but I think there's enough talks about how wonderful it is, how amazing it is, and there's a number of things that go on when you make this DevOps transformation that if you make it in a vacuum, you're kind of like, maybe we did something wrong. And then suddenly it's like, oh, no, everybody had to figure that out. And you're like, oh, well, I wish I had known that. So I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the things that we encountered and hopefully share or save you guys some pain. Uh, before we get started, though, I'll just kind of rehash. My name is Jeff Smith. I manage site reliability engineering at Grubhub. How many of us have heard of Grubhub? All right. For those of you that haven't, go to it. It's awesome. Grubhub.com. We connect diners with restaurants to get food delivered. Um, and it is a tremendous experience, and I hope you enjoy it. And if you do enjoy it, we are hiring. It is amazing how difficult it is to get food from one place to another. Tons of technology, tons of interesting problems. So if you're interested, grubhub.com slash careers, or you can see me after the talk. Uh, I'm on Twitter. You can find me at dark and nerdy. Uh, my email address is jeff at all things dork. Um, last but not least, this is not a diversity talk. So surprise. <laughs> now that that elephant's out of the room. Um, <laughs> There's, a, there's probably a couple of things I should probably tell you about myself, too, before we get started, just to kind of like frame the context of this talk, right? Um, I guess I'm considered sort of a, a downer on things, right? Uh, everything is terrible, sort of, in my book. And not because I'm one of those grumpy people that just hates everything, but it's just that I believe strongly that there is no such thing as a perfect solution. And I try to eradicate any ideas or suggestions that this solution that my team comes up with is just going to work, right? Because there's always trade-offs. There's always things that are good and bad, and you kind of have to deal with that, right? Even my four-year-old is starting to learn that, right? It's like, oh, I didn't know if I skipped ice cream, I could have cake later. It's like, well, yeah, that's a trade-off, right? Same thing with systems design. So um, take everything I'm saying with a little bit of grain of salt. The other thing you should know about me is, unfortunately, I am not an expert. I'm not a thought leader. I have a blog. Probably gets about 30 hits a month. But, so, so your mileage on this may vary. But I want to just let you guys know that you know, we have kind of gone through these pains and troubles. So uh, understand that this is from our perspective. Rainbows, unicorns, right? Like, that's kind of what we talk about in GrubOps, or in, um, <laughs> in GrubOps, in DevOps. Uh, man, that looks a lot worse on a big screen like that. Holy cow. But that's kind of where we are with the state of DevOps right now, right? Everything is beautiful, everything is amazing, there's rainbows everywhere. But that's not quite true, right? And <laughs> the analogy that we kind of use is like, imagine you're at a factory, and that factory we say, you know what, you guys need to get in the rainbow business, just put rainbows everywhere. And they're like, all right, sweet, we're gonna do that. And then at the end of the day, they're like, you know, we've got all these rainbows up, but it's always bright out now. You know, no one can go to sleep. And we're like, oh yeah, that happens to everyone, right? So many people, though, get to that rainbow section and they're like, oh, we must have done something wrong, right? Because obviously, if other people were having this problem, they wouldn't be espousing how awesome this is. There's a series of problems that comes up and you have to address them appropriately. And not everything is rosy. So why the switch to DevOps for us? Um, a lot of the common reasons that most of you guys have, right? When you just have code and you throw it over the fence to ops, nobody wins, right? It's problematic all across. Most of us have probably experienced that. Just a quick show of hands. How many people identify themselves as developers? And how many people as ops folks? OK. All right, cool. Um, so uh, yeah, tossing code over the fence isn't beneficial for anyone. It's problematic. But the other thing is, ops and dev really have different mindsets on how we approach problems, right? And that's normal, because in reality, we have slightly different incentives, right? As a result of that, we have slightly different mindsets. But both, sets, both mindsets are useful to both groups, right? So there's a lack of a development mindset in operations, and there's a lack of an operational mindset in development. 
So when we saw DevOps, we saw that as an opportunity to kind of marry these two things and hopefully execute better and bring that mindset, those disparate mindsets to both teams. So when we initially rolled out DevOps, um, the first thing we had to do is we had to look at the org structure, right? Because you have people like me that are managers that have direct reports, and we say, now we're going to take dev, we're going to take ops, and we're going to mush them together. And people say, all right, but what does that mean, right? Does that mean I report to this person? Is my job title changing? These are all real things that you have to deal with because there are people involved, right? So if I just told you, you know, one day, like, hey, we're going to change the way we work. I'm going to give you a slightly different title, and it's going to be awesome. You're going to have a series of questions that you have to have answered, right? Who do I report to? Who's my boss? If I'm working with this development team, are they my boss? If, if operations is here, um, you know, what does that mean in terms of what my responsibilities are as a developer? Um, so that was one of the big things we had to tackle. The other thing was tool sets and workflows for the ops team. As we kind of hinted towards earlier, there's a lack of a development mindset in some operational shops. Not all of them, your mileage may vary, but in some of them, there is that, that fundamental lack because we haven't worked in those types of environments, right? Um, source control for us was a bunch of back files with dates on them, and it was awesome, um, but it didn't work out so well. Uh, so as a result of that, you also have to deal with changing skill sets that are necessary for the teams, both in development and operations, right? Operations has to learn things surrounding the software development lifecycle. Development has to learn things in terms of like what it takes to run a system in production, the types of data you need, the types of alerting you need, things like that. So you have to prepare yourself that it's not going to be just we're going to take these two teams, we're going to mush them together and everything's going to be magical. There are a number of things that are going to have to be addressed from a skill set perspective in order for you to be truly successful. So as I, I talk around in the DevOps community, um, I find a couple of different org, stru org structures that exist, right? Um, the first org structure that I see is ops team members are, imbe are embedded in development teams, and they report to those team leads. It's sort of like this unified team, right? There is no real separate ops organization anymore. Um, then there's a model where there's op team members who remain separate, but there's some sort of official engagement process for those resources. And that's sort, of this, uh, that's sort of the model that we've used. We have a separate tech ops org structure, but each SRE reports directly, well not directly, but reports to a stream team lead. So they're a member of that team in, in, um, in context, but in reality, that line is dotted, and they still report into me, and I report into the VP of tech ops. And then the third one is a new team is formed called DevOps. It's effectively a third silo, and Probably after a year, you'll realize that it's actually release engineering. Um, I think that's a, a common pattern that we see where you see a DevOps job and you're like, hmm, this sounds exactly like release engineering. That's because it is. Uh, we'll talk about the third silo a little bit more, but you know, avoid the third silo if possible. Stop and think about what you're doing. You want to destroy silos by adding another silo. Greatest goof of all time. So this is a quick look of what our org structure looks like. So we've got the VP of engineering, we've got functional leads, team leads, dev, QA, and business analysts. Then we have a separate org structure where we've got the VP of tech ops, team leads, and a bunch of ops members that report into the team leads. Um, like I said, there's that dotted line so that uh, our ops staff are part of the team, right? They participate in the team stand-ups, they participate in the team's iteration planning meetings, but they still report to a separate organization. And why that is, we'll get into in just a second, because it's another thing that kind of bites you. So some of the benefits of our choice, the way we uh, ended up doing it is, one, we do get closer engagement with our development teams, right? Because we're in the stream teams, because we're in the iteration planning meetings, because we're in the stand-ups, you know, we are interfacing with devs at a much higher rate than we ever have before. And uh, development is interfacing with operations a lot more. You know, it's always kind of looked at from one side in terms of like what ops is getting from it. But development gets quite a bit of benefit too because now they sort of have this point contact person that they can get the access that we've probably grumpily denied in the past. Um, there's a renewed focus on alerting and monitoring. Now that we've got a single team that's sort of responsible for this product from beginning to end, there's this new focus on like, well, how is this app performing, right? And it goes beyond just CPU utilization and memory utilization. It goes into things like, you know, how many orders per second are we doing? You know, how long is it taking to fulfill an order? These sort of businessy metrics that help shape and uh, provide context for how the services are performing 
that are more than just like, oh, we're at 40% CPU utilization, right? What does that mean from a business impact standpoint? It doesn't mean anything. So having SREs on the teams, having Dev and Ops work together, um, one, it gives SREs uh, an avenue to kind of talk with developers and say like, hey, what are the things that we should be measuring? And two, uh, it's the same way the other way. The developers can say like, hey, you know, I don't know how the system performs because I don't have access to your cool tools. Give me the access so that we can build this thing and make it run better. Um, larger options for tool selection due to ops staff being present early. What I mean by that is, so uh, I'm going to give like a little operational confession here. Technology happens to us sometimes in ops, right? Like, you're humming along, you're doing great, you know, you're, you've got all types of monitoring on your MySQL database, and then someone says, you know, we've got a new product coming in that's going to run Couchbase, and it's going to have no JS front end, and it's going to be awesome. Here it is. When that happens to you, your knee-jerk reaction is to say, oh, no, no way, not going to have it, not going to do it, and I'm going to give you all these reasons why. I guarantee you, in nine times out of ten, if you move that conversation nine months earlier, where the code is really just on the back of a napkin, and you say, hey, Jeff, we're thinking about using Couchbase and Node.js. I'd be like, man, I just read a blog post about that. That's awesome. Let's do it. It's the difference between yay or nay um, from an operational perspective. So we're finding that uh, developers feel a lot more comfortable coming up and saying, like, hey, there are some different tools that we want to use. Here's why we want to use them. Let's figure out what we need to do in order to make that happen. And a lot of times, from an operational perspective, it's like, sure, here are the things that we need to do or address in order to do that. We know it up front so that when it gets to production, everything is tooled out the way it needs to be, and ops and dev are happy. And ultimately, it's a reduction of us versus them, right? Because there is no us or them, because we're all sitting in the same quad, right? Sharing the same pizza, sharing the same jokes, sharing the same crappy Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes there's always that belief, right? Like, Opta has better Wi-Fi than us because they own it. Uh, not true, ours is terrible too. Now, that's the good stuff, the bad and the ugly. It's not too terrible, but um, there are some organizational issues that come up. One of them being, from an ops perspective, even though we've sort of taken our SREs and embedded them into the stream teams, there are a ton of things that ops are st is still responsible for that the development and product teams, I mean, honestly, they, they don't really care about in the long term, right? Not that they don't care about it. That sounds terrible. But, like, it's tough to say, hey, you know that really cool feature you wanted to implement and you need me two, you know, two uh, hours a week for? I can't do that because I have to patch LDAP, right? That's not really something that the development teams want to hear because that's not really in their purview of the things that they're responsible for. So we find that there, are, there was a, a bit of tug and war in terms of, Resources, because even though we said, hey, you're going to have a bunch of dedicated resources, in reality, they're not dedicated. They're partially dedicated, pseudo-dedicated. Oh, that looks terrible. Um, the other piece is incident management. Now, developers are starting to help a lot more with incident management, um, but uh, that doesn't remove the fact that ops is still largely interrupt-driven when it comes to managing production, right? So how, as a developer, do you plan your sprint if you need the SRE resource, knowing that at any point he could be pulled away and forced to work on another issue, right? These aren't insurmountable things. They're just things that you need to figure out, like, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to prioritize these things? Um, the constant context switching um, also becomes difficult, right? Because now people are serving two masters, right? The SRE, the ops staff is responsible, one, to the development team, and because they're part of that team, they don't want to let the team down, they want to make sure they're meeting their deadlines, but they're also responsible to me, right? And I need to patch my SQL. I need to upgrade LDAP. I need to do a PCI audit. So that context switching tends to create a lot of friction. How do you address that? Well, you know, you address it through planning, but um, if you don't know that going into it, you kind of think like, oh, I've got this dedicated resource and life is going to be great, and it's not. Um, so that's something that we've had to deal with as well. We've largely addressed it through uh, having a separate operational planning meeting so that we can lay out all of the things that ops needs to get done, and we have an opportunity to weigh those against the things that the product team has to get done. Uh, so, you know, it's basically a large meeting with all the team leads, and we basically say, here are the things that we want to get done, you guys say the things that you need done will prioritize together. That way we're making a decision based on the needs of the business 
and we move forward from there. Or then sometimes the meeting is empty and it's like, okay, I guess nothing needs to be prioritized. I'll have my fun with it. Priorities. A term that keeps coming up. You know, I'm really bothered that priority actually has a plural form, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense when you think about it. It should be priority, it, period, one, singular. But we live in a world with priorities. Um, so who sets the priorities, right? Where does that come from? Does it come from ops? Does it come from the dev team? I told you how we sort of address that. Um, we need to balance the ops work intake with the team velocity. And what I mean by that is uh, as the stream teams start to do their iteration planning meetings, right? We have to be cognizant that ops has a bunch of stuff that they need to get done too. So we need to make sure, and that's my job largely, is to say, okay, I can't overload these guys with too much operations work because he, has, he or she has a bunch of product work that also needs to get done. So being aware of that balance and being, you know, very in tune with the team leads is very, very important in order to be successful because you have to understand what it is that they're putting out for work and what it is that you're putting in the queue for work. Um, are ops staff needed for every team? My knee-jerk reaction is yes. Seeing the difficulty I've had in hiring, I go, eh, eh maybe, maybe not, right? Um, there, are, there are some teams whose work, um, specifically in like, you know, the, the amount of production stuff that they're shipping out, doesn't warrant a full-time ops staff member. So in that case, we basically give them half time, or we have uh, uh, an engagement process so that when they do need a resource, they know who to contact so that we can assign a particular resource to address their needs. They're typically happy because they're like, well, you know, we don't need a guy taking up a chair that isn't really, you know, helping the team out. We don't want someone sitting in an iteration planning meeting, you know, 90 minutes a week that's not getting anything out of it. So being aware of how your teams are leveraging the SRE resources is very important. Um, dedicated resources leads to poor planning, right, because you assume that this person is always gonna be available. That's not always the case. It's problematic. You have to still plan for these resources and coordinate appropriately. Now, it's still a boon because you have this dedicated person that you go to and you know who to ask and who to talk to. Um, and the way we typically structure it is like, you know, you go, the team leads or anyone on the team goes to the SRE, and if the SRE has a conflict, he escalates. If not, he or she can mediate it right there and figure out what to do next. So when the DevOps line is blurred, um, when you start moving into DevOps, you know, you, you start to talk about sometimes you hear about the model you build it, you run it, right? That's the idea that a product team is responsible for a solution all the way from code commit to production deploy into monitoring. But if you're coming from a traditional organization, you've probably lived in a world where it's like, Dev has no access to production, right? We don't really do that. We're available for like second and third level support if you need it, but largely that's on you guys. That doesn't always work in a DevOps environment because essentially you've got this new team member and you tell her like, hey, you're joining the team, you're part of the team, you're one of us, you're the only one on call. See how that goes over, right? <laughs> it doesn't go over well. But at the same time, you gotta look at it from the development perspective where they're like, you know, I kind of went into dev, so I wasn't on call. <laughs> um, so you have to figure out what that balance looks like. But the other thing you have to figure out is, how do you give that person, the developer, production access? Because nothing, I mean, nothing is more infuriating than getting paged at two in the morning and not having access to do a damn thing to help, right? Can I look at this? No, I can't see it because I don't have access to production. Uh, can I fix this? No, I really can't because I don't have access to production. That was weird. They found it, okay, sweet. Maybe they're just checking the lock. Um, so yeah, so that's something that you have to address. The way that we're attempting to address it is basically through uh, instrumenting the hell out of everything, right? Push as many metrics, as many um, types of changes that you need to do through some automation tool and try to, autom and try to audit that automation tool set, right? Um, we were just having a conversation outside, Steve and uh, another guy from uh, Braintree, about this new uh, script that came out for EC2 instances that basically will flag an EC2 instance if someone has logged into it. So you get a special tag on it. So we're gonna be implementing that to basically say, oh, someone has logged into this box for some reason. Let's run a report, let's find out why that person had to log into that box so that we can ask them, what did you need to do that was on the box that you couldn't do through another tool, right? Why couldn't you do it in Splunk? Why couldn't you do it through Datadog? 
why wasn't there a Jenkins job? From there, we can kind of build up our repertoire of tools for the common types of activities that we do on a regular basis, or hopefully not so regular if it's an incident. But it's something that you have to build, and you're not going to know everything day one. So you're going to have to slowly iterate over it, right? So don't beat yourself up when you're like, oh, man, we got to keep logging into the box. It takes time. This is muscle memory, right? That's the first thing people do. I remember when we first implemented Splunk, people were still doing X-term windows with seven sessions and broadcasting to the terminal. And it's like, dude, use Splunk. Source type Apache access. All the servers are queried. Done. It takes a while to get rid of that muscle memory. And if you've been in a traditional work for a while, I could see that being problematic. Um, but when it comes to production access, you have a, another series of problems that crops up too. I love this picture. I absolutely love it. It's DevOps unicorn crapping all over security, right? And that's what happens if you're not careful, right? It's so easy. To, and just so you know, I just threw this in here because I was like, this is hilarious. i got to figure out something to talk about this. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, I sent it to our chief of security, too, because I was like, this is pretty much what you've been telling me, right? Um, as we build up these tools, as we build up the automation, as we let the floodgates loose on uh, developers being able to help access and manage production, we have to think about security, right? Because that's still a thing, right? Audits are still a thing. And... Nothing is worse than when your security guy is like, all right, we got to do an, oh my goodness, what is going on with this access log in these servers, right? That's what my security guy means. And he's like, you guys are just crapping out rainbows, but I've got to shovel it up. So you want to keep that in the back of your mind when you're sort of automating these things. How's that going to tie into my other processes? Specifically around the woes of the audit, right? Um, audits are a fact of life. They happen, and they can add complexity to DevOps workflows. Mainly around like things like we've sort of built a lot of our organizations around the idea of uh, separation of duties, right? How many of you heard that, why you couldn't have access to a server? Hey, man, you can't do that, separation of duties, man. You can't write code and deploy it. <laughs> that's crazy, man. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> we don't do that. Well, we do that now, right? <laughs> but how do we address the audit concerns around that? How do we prove that, you know, this uh, deploy that we did was QA'd by someone other than the developer. And those are things that you kind of have to think about in terms of your, your tooling and your tool chain, right? How many guys have change management in your environment? And how many of your deploys are under change management? Right? So uh, what do you do, right? Our answer has been automate as much as possible, right? So we've tried to define the workflow. And as you define the workflow, we automate the hell out of the workflow. Then we put the tools that automate that workflow through change management. So if you make a change to the tool set, that's the thing that has to go under change management. But if you're deploying and you're following the standard tool chain, those deploys can just go. Now you've got to work with security to figure out what those requirements are, right? Because as much as we like go through the process of creating the ticket, security doesn't really care about the actual ticket. They want to care about the process that was behind the ticket. So we thought we had a win. We're like, hey, we're automatically creating JIRA tickets. Done. No. <laughs> no. You know, how do I know that this was tested? How do I know that it was tested by someone other than the developer? Uh, how do I know that this isn't a uh, financial audit scope application and what, what uh, deployment path has to change as a result of that? So work closely with security to get an understanding of what it is that you need to do in order to meet that bar. And honestly, security loves it. Right? I thought it was going to be a nightmare. My security guy's like, yeah, yeah, if you can automate all of that and we can put a process around the changes, I'm all for it. Bend over backwards to help me out. He was willing to write code, which is scary because he doesn't code. But <laughs> he was like, I'll do it, man. He's a full stack overflow developer. Um, <laughs> the other last one is probably the biggest one, right? Your audit controls, right? So many people go to the web and figure out what other people are doing for their audit, and then they regurgitate that in their audit controls. You know what auditors care about? You say what you do, you do what you say. That's it, right? So if you don't need fingerprint verification for every deploy, don't put it in your document, right? Think about what it is that you really need to address in your audit and document it appropriately. Work with dev, work with ops, work with sec, and just 
Say what you do, and then do what you say. It's that simple. We've had, in the past, so many crazy controls where we're like, well, this is security theater right here. I mean, this isn't really adding any value. He says, well, take it out. We're like, oh, we can do that? Yeah. <laughs> you just can't do it during the audit. <laughs> okay, cool. Things are moving a lot smoother. Be wary of the third silo. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Don't create the DevOps team. I'm begging you, don't do it. In fact, <laughs> I was on a mission to destroy the DevOps engineer role in my company. Every time I saw it posted, I was like, no, we're not calling it a DevOps engineer. I ultimately lost because marketing won, right? So now we have the same job posting posted three times as a DevOps engineer, as a site reliability engineer, as a systems engineer. Why? Because that's what people are searching for, okay? But when it comes to the actual organization, Try to kill it with fire if you see that third silo forming up. You want to know why? Because it happens exactly as you think it would happen. Everyone kind of steps back. Oh, well, that's DevOps's thing, right? That's not us. We're not responsible for that. Dev and ops together. Leave it at that. Um, the DevOps team also further concentrates that sort of responsibility, um, kind of like I was just uh, mentioning. The, the, the DevOps team starts taking on like all of this automation stuff, and the other bit of that is a lot of that stuff is the cool things in the field right now, in the industry, right? And you can build a lot of resentment when you have a third silo, and it's like, oh, no, 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 they do the AWS stuff. They do the automation stuff. You just rotate backup logs and, you know, I don't know, get alerted when the disk fills up. That's not fun. Not fun for anybody. So, if you see the third silo starting to form, kill it with fire. Um, oh, yeah, and the other thing, ownership of production environment is even murkier, right? Because I'm not going to let someone tool out the entire process and then step away like, well, it's not me if things went bad, right? Sorry, that deploy crash. Call the other silo. That's their thing now. Nope. Choosing a tool set. So this is, this is controversial, I think. Um, with DevOps, we get so hung up in tools, right? You got Docker, Jenkins, EC2. Uh, we have all these blog posts coming at us about all these magical things that Google and Facebook are doing, right? You're not Google. You're not Facebook, unless you are, but you're probably not. Anyone at Google scale here? No? I didn't think so. So <laughs> reading about how Google solves their problems, while it's interesting bathroom reading, probably not something you want to take back and be like, hey, we need to implement this because we're getting at least 120 hits a second. We need to be able to scale dynamic. Calm down. Solve your problems, right? So when you're choosing your tool set, make sure you keep that in mind. Well, what problem am I solving for my company, right? What are my organization's problems, right? You could implement Docker with Kubernetes, with dynamic, you know, uh, scaling, auto-scaling groups, but if you really just need to manage sudoers better, right? <laughs> There's easier ways to do that. Um, commit to iteration, too. You're not going to nail it the first time. You're not. Um, it's easy to think like, oh, man, we're behind the curve. Everyone's story is different. Everyone's organization is different. Everyone's going to work at their own pace. As long as you're getting better, that's the thing that's awesome, right? One day, you're going to sit back and you're going to realize, like, I remember maybe six months ago, we had an outage. It wasn't even an outage. We had a degradation in service, right, that lasted 15 minutes. And we're all on fire trying to figure out, well, what happened? How did we not get alerted to this sooner? What type of KPIs would have assisted with this? And then you stop and you think, and you're like, man, a year and a half ago, this thing would have been down for 30 minutes, and customer care would have called us and told us, like, hey, diners aren't getting X, Y, Z, right? If you do that iteration slowly, you find yourself in another place, you're always making yourself better, and before you realize, you're gonna look back and you're gonna not even recognize the past you. Like, how did we let that stand? That's, that's insane. So don't feel like you have to do everything at once, because the other catch with that too is, it prevents you from making any progress. Well, we can't do this because we don't have elastic auto-scaling groups, and we can't do that because we don't have KPI metrics, so we're just gonna sit on our hands and do nothing. Nope, if it's something that's tiny, you know, like, oh, here's this, service that we have to restart every other week, right? Automate that. Build on that. Build on your successes. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Um, and try to find quick wins, right? Try to find little things that you can do today because 
uh, you'd be surprised at how the little hurdles that you face um, quickly add up to become big things. So if you can find little things to kind of help build that momentum, you'll get everyone on board, everyone moving in the same direction, and it's awesome. But the biggest thing is to solve your own problems. Please, please, please. Uh, sometimes I wish Google and Facebook would just stop writing blog posts. Addressing skill set gaps is another key area that, that we're working through still. Um, we've come a long way already, but there's still you know, places where we've got people that have come from traditional ops environments, right? Um, and they may not be developers, or may not, they, may not be con, um, they may not be accustomed to infrastructure as a code or the software development life cycle. These people are still valuable, right? Like, don't think you need to retool your entire organization, right? People can learn. These are smart folks. So you just need to figure out where your gaps are and address them appropriately. And the, the field is so vast, so vast, that everyone doesn't have to be a hardcore developer, right? Everyone doesn't have to be a hardcore performance engineer, right? People can find their niches and provide value to the team in those particular areas. So one thing that we did that really helped was we had to choose a common programming language um, for the operational type of work that we were going to do. We're predominantly a Java shop, right? The idea of building tools for operations in Java made me gag. Literally, they were like, well, we could use No. Um, so we rallied around Python. So now that we've kind of chosen a common tool set, we're able to build libraries. Um, after we build those libraries, people can consume those libraries, and then it ends up building sort of a natural order of skill sets, right? We've got our most senior engineers building libraries that can be consumed and utilized by the folks that are just learning, right? So if you're coming into it and you're just starting to learn Python, you don't have to wrestle these complex things like, oh, well, how am I going to dynamically fetch data out of our key value store? Well, there's a library that's going to do that for you. Don't worry about it. We'll get you there eventually. And then you also have code that people can review to sort of learn about you know, our particular style of how we do things. The other benefit to choosing a common programming language um, is, is uh, easier adoption in general, right? And it's much easier to find resources when you actually need to hire. So now when we hire, we're like, oh, if you have a language, if it's Python, that's the bomb, right? Easy. Uh, we, we don't have to worry about, well, you know, he's good in Ruby, but not good in Go, but he's kind of okay in Perl. Python's our language of choice. If you feel comfortable switching to Python, then, you know, that's, that's also fair game, but uh, the direction is clear. We also have to start hiring a little bit differently for ops. Um, now that ops is becoming more of a, a broader skill set, it might be worthwhile to bring in people from different areas as part of the interview process, right? Have someone from dev interview ops folks, right? Have a DBA interview someone from ops, right? Get an idea of, of where this person's skill set lies. Because I think it was Charity Majors that said, uh, you're looking for T-shaped engineers, right? Broad in a bunch of areas, but deep in one area. And you may not have the skill set on your team specifically to figure out where that person goes deep. But knowing that a person is capable of going deep says a lot about their capabilities for learning, for progressing, and for <coughs> assimilating into your environment. Make sure that you emphasize the common language that's being chosen, right? Because you don't want someone to come in and then be like, you know, all right, well, I know we're using Python, but, you know, this Erlang thing is the bomb. How do I get everyone to switch to that? Nope. Make sure it's clear and upfront in the interview process. Um, and also, put an emphasis on the development mindset, right? Doesn't mean they have to be a rock star coder, but make sure that they understand the concepts, right? Make sure that they're on board with testing, right? Testing, that's going to be a big thing that we're going to need devs to help ops out with. We'll get into that in a second. Um, but just make sure they're on board with the philosophy and the method of doing things, because it'll make the integration with dev and ops so much easier if everyone's on the same page. Training isn't enough either. We always say like, oh, you know, we'll train these guys to do a thing, right? And somehow that time just never magically forms. You have to commit to it, right? You have to say like, you know, we are going to give you this thing to do and we're going to make you responsible for it. That's where the motivation comes from. That's where we find the time to make these things happen. If it's just a goal at the beginning of the year that says, oh, learn Python, it doesn't happen. 
Same thing with development, right? If we say, you know, you have to have a better systems understanding, you're not going to get that systems understanding through osmosis, right? You probably won't even get it through just reading. Application is the sort of cement that fuses these ideas and concepts and allows you to actually execute them in the production environment. Um, find mentors, right? You guys can swap. Op staff can be mentored by dev and vice versa. Works out pretty good. Um, it also sort of like, how many of you are familiar with the concept of imposter syndrome? Right, so uh, I have chronic imposter syndrome. And what imposter syndrome is, is it, it's basically the idea that you have difficulty internalizing your own successes, right? So you're constantly in fear that you're gonna be called a fraud, you're gonna get called out, right? That imposter syndrome is more prevalent than people realize, but it's also a barrier to asking questions, right? So when you have that sort of cross-mentorship, it gives someone the comfort knowing that, oh, this guy's asking me questions that he doesn't know, now I feel comfortable asking him questions that I don't know. Okay, whew, I was like, oh man. Uh, so training isn't enough. Make sure you find a project that you guys can a actively work towards. Um, not everyone is a developer. Not everyone is an ops person. Again, remember that people have different skills, and those skills are valuable, and they can still be leveraged and be successful in part of the team, right? Um, help team members get out of their wheelhouse when possible, right? Uh, if there's something that they're just completely not comfortable with and they've never tried it, you know, give them something small to kind of play with. Maybe they find out it isn't their cup of tea, right? But at least now you know, as opposed to just some inane fear that has existed since, you know, C++ 101, right? Um, and remember that emotions are important. We talk a lot about hug ops and DevOps, right? But I, I think one of the biggest things that attracted me to the community is the sort of empathy that's projected and discussed, right? We're talking about actual human beings with actual feelings, actual emotions, and you have to take that into account, not only just during your DevOps uh, transformation, but as a culture in general. Because once you build empathy, it makes teamwork so much easier. Google actually put out a study that basically said team members that are most effective are ones that aren't jerks, essentially. Be nice to each other. Everyone's trying to do the best they can, right? All we can do is kind of help them get along there. All right, the journey to DevOps is hard and your journey will differ from others, but it's totally worth it. So as you go out, as you start these transformations in your organizations, make sure you're talking to other people. Make sure you're engaged in your community. Ask questions because chances are someone has encountered that same problem that you have. Be empathetic. Make sure you're treating everyone with uh, respect. Make sure you understand that everyone is in a different place. So don't give that, you know, snide remark like, oh, you're still using classic ASP. It's not like I want to use classic ASP. I don't have a choice, right? <laughs> That's just where I'm at right now. <laughs> so keep that in mind um, and just be good to each other. Uh, that's it. Thanks very much. That was awesome. I, I still have imposter syndrome as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so questions. You talk about Python as your core language. What about the case where Bash or similar would be simpler or faster or better? So, you know, modulo your, your slide, which is like, all tools suck. Right, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, we actually have that uh, same conversation. And we avoid, like, Perl or other languages like that. It's pretty much a choice between Bash and Python. And basically, my bar is if I need any form of complex data structure, Python. Pretty simple, right? Like, oh, you need an array? Nope. <laughs> Not in Bash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're a masochist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the only other question we got on here. Does anyone have any questions, like, in person without typing into a keyboard? Yay. How you bring the ops up as a first class citizen? 
Right. Well, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. So, so the question was, um, as uh, in his organization, uh, development is largely responsible for a lot of the ops tasks, and the ops is sort of like a second-class citizen. How do we go about elevating the ops staff to have an equal seat at the table? Uh, the, I guess the first question is, do you guys have any outages at all? Because I feel like ops's value, unfortunately, is usually brought about when there's an outage and there's some heroic effort. The other day, our CEO came to me and he was like, oh, Jeff, yeah, I heard you, I'm taking a, a short sabbatical. And he says, oh, I heard you're taking a sabbatical and I just wanted to chat with you real quick. Of course, I know you from all the outages. And it's like, ow. Ow, right? <laughs> like, I, I want to be the fire marshal. I don't want to be the firefighter, right? Um, so uh, those outages is, is the opportunity that ops should seize to have a seat at the table and say, like, here are the things that we could have done better earlier in the process that would have prevented the need for these heroic efforts, right? So, you know, fire, fire marshal versus firefighter. So you, you keep sort of driving those points home and eventually, someone's going to realize, like, you know, this issue happened before, and we didn't address that. Maybe we need to get ops at the table sooner. Maybe we need to get ops at the table earlier. And once you start getting involved in the process earlier, ops becomes invaluable, especially when ops starts adding insight that developers hadn't thought of simply because the mindset is different. Um. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, really enjoyed this session. I have two questions for you. It seems like your organization is, uh, it, would you consider your organization as a center of excellence for DevOps that works between tech ops and engineering? A center of excellence. That's. I, that. I'm trying to understand how do you, how your organization take DevOps and their methodology to the next level by learning what happens in engineering and how that flow between both of those organizations. And my second part of question was, what capacity you keeping for your organization or your members to elevate themselves to the next level? Is it 50-50 where they do work for a development team, 50% and 50% for operation? I will stop there, thanks. Yep. All right, so a couple things. Uh, do we consider ourselves a center of excellence? You know, I, I don't know that I've ever put that label on us just because I feel like we're, maybe it's my imposter syndrome, I feel like we're always in our infancy in this process, right? So we're always iterating, we're always trying to get better. Um, I feel like we are a center of excellence in our effort to be better. Um, but there's always room for improvement, right? So I, I think it's important to generate a feedback loop with your staff, with your development teams, to understand what are we doing bad that we can do better? Where are the things where we're not meeting uh, your expectations and vice versa so that we can continuously work towards making that better? Um, in terms of your second question, um, I believe the question was, uh, what are we doing to sort of enhance our skill set? And what capacity do you have to do that more? Right. And what capacity do we have uh, for that? So we're fortunate in that uh, our CEO comes from a very technical background, and he has a strong commitment to learning. So we have this concept called Learning Fridays, where basically every Friday they come in, they cater lunch, and they say from you know ten, from nine o'clock to noon, get anything that you need wrapped up from the pre from the previous week done, and then from noon to the rest of the day, it's your time, learn, tinker come up with solutions that the company might be able to use, um, but it's your time to kind of learn and grow your skill set any way that you see fit. And it's a phenomenal opportunity because, you know, one, not a lot of organizations have it, but two, not a lot of organizations have it with the full support of the CEO who basically came in and said, listen, guys, I didn't realize we had stopped doing this. We're going to start doing this again. I'm going to tell all the product managers that they only get your time Monday through Thursday. Uh, so that's sort of a huge commitment from the organization. Um, how you do that in other orgs, it's tough, right? You really have to build the time in and make sure that uh, your management is protecting that time because it's very easy to get that time taken from you. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, you had tried, or you had, you had seen, uh, you had experience with integrating ops directly into the reporting structure of uh, developers delivering products. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on where the challenges are with that, and uh, what do you think about potentially like 
having two classes of operations where half is in that uh, reporting structure and then there's a kind of more global operations that can work with them but is more global for the whole organization. Right, right, so uh, good question. Um, so the initial experience with, with uh, integrating the team was largely on the whiteboard, right? Because we said, all right, if we start integrating these teams, who is going to take these functions that the SRE group currently has? So a little background, you know, Grubhub's about 10 years old now, or maybe 12, and uh, they started small, scrappy startup, right? So it was like everyone did everything. Um, as we started to form an operations groups, you know, the stuff that would typically be held by an IT organization was held by the SREs. So when we started coming up with DevOps, we say, well, if we integrate these folks, how do we you know, consciously put LDAP support on the plate of a product team? So that's sort of what led to this hybrid split that we have today. The other thing was we wanted to make sure that the uh, systems engineers, and this might show that we were sort of hedging our bets, we wanted to make sure that the systems ad engineers had a, uh, a mechanism for escalating issues out of their reporting structure, i.e., you know, hey, there's this horrible SSL bug. We've got to stop everything and implement the fix. Well, my incentives are a little different, and I need to get this product out. So th the question was, like, how do we make sure that they have an avenue to escalate outside of that? And that's ultimately what led us to where we are. In terms of your other question with the second operations thing, yes, that's a thing. Um, we actually still technically have that in our environment. Um, we have a, a group that we call GrubOps, which is basically our NOC, and they are largely responsible for the legacy system um, that we are migrating away from. So they are in a support function for that, and they serve almost exactly like you were saying, where they're an operations arm, but they're really not involved with the day-to-day -day product stuff. They're not part of the Scrum. We, we're trying to build that bridge from SRE to GrubOps, but I have effectively called it out to my management as a third silo that needs to be uh, eliminated. Um, I think the, the best opportunity would be to also integrate that group into the stream teams or into the SREs or, or use them as uh, junior, develop, junior engineers, right? So we say, all right, well, we're gonna pair each one of you GrubOps folks with an SRE and that'll be your mentor and we'll essentially serve, use it as a pipeline. Okay, that's unfortunately all we have time for. Thanks very much, Jeff. Thank you.